Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I am Susie Brubaker Cole, and I am Stanford's Vice Provost for Student Affairs. On behalf of Stanford University, I welcome you to the 2018 Mimi and Peter E. Haas Distinguished Visitor Lecture on Public Service, and I welcome you to the university as well. I would like to thank Mimi Haas for her vision and leadership in working with us to establish the Mimi and Peter E. Haas Distinguished Visitor Program that brings visionary global leaders for a Stanford residency to engage with students, faculty, and our larger university community. Thank you also to the Haas Center for Public Service for hosting and to many departments, centers, and organizations for co-sponsoring tonight's event focused on public service and the university. We are recording this evening's lecture and we'll post a video on the Haas Center's website. Ted Koppel has spent time at Stanford at the moment that we are experiencing through cardinal service the boldest expansion of public service at Stanford since the Haas Center's founding more than 30 years ago. Cardinal Service is a university-wide initiative to elevate and expand service as a distinctive feature of a Stanford education. By the year 2020, Cardinal Service will enable 500 students, regardless of their financial status, to pursue funded opportunities to engage in full-time service for a quarter or more each year. It will more than triple the number of cardinal courses offered, in, offered annually to 200 community-engaged learning courses offered across 50 academic departments and programs. And students will be encouraged to make sustained commitments to service through cardinal commitment, and to pursue careers in the public interest through cardinal careers. More than the numbers, cardinal service is part of Stanford's efforts to be more purposeful as we help students develop civic identities and gain the knowledge, skills, and habits to tackle today's global challenges. If there is someone who understands the significance of public service leadership and vibrant civil discourse, it is Ted Koppel. Mr. Koppel earned his master's degree at Stanford in 1962, and over the course of 26 years as anchor and managing editor of Nightline, he became the longest serving news anchor in US broadcast history. He has also served as a contributing columnist to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, and as senior contributor to CBS Sunday Morning Show. Mr. Koppel has received eight Peabody Awards, 12 DuPont Columbia Awards, television's equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize, and 42 Emmy Awards, including one for Lifetime Achievement. During more than 50 years as a journalist, he has covered, among other historic events, John F. Kennedy's funeral in 1963, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Civil Rights March from Selma to Montgomery in 1965, Richard Nixon's presidential campaign in 1968, and a succession of 10 conflicts as an ABC News war correspondent. Mr. Koppel was with Mikhail Gorbachev inside the Kremlin on the last day of the Soviet Union. He was also the first journalist to interview Nelson Mandela at his home in Soweto, South Africa, upon his release from 27 years in prison. We have been honored to have Ted Koppel and his wife, Grace Ann Dorney Koppel, also a Stanford alum, in residence at the Haas Center during winter and spring quarters of this year. Mr. Koppel has challenged us during a historic moment for our country, one in which we must confront profound and challenging questions about our democratic institutions, the role of news media and social networks in spreading information and misinformation, and how to address heightened concerns over cybersecurity and personal data. These are questions that will decide who we are as a nation and who we will become. It is moments like these when well-informed and productive civil discourse become even more valuable. And we are deeply grateful for Mr. Koppel's insight and inspiration. Please join me in welcoming our 2018 distinguished visitor, Ted Koppel.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take a moment just to, to recognize Mimi Haas, who is here with us this evening. I think it goes without saying that we wouldn't have a Mimi and Peter E. Haas Center <laughs> without the generosity of her family. Um, I also want to, uh, to recognize Tom Schnabelt. Um, it was almost exactly a year ago that I received this wonderful letter from Tom uh, in which he explained what the Distinguished Visitor Program was all about, gave me some background on, on some of the previous Distinguished Visitors who had been out there, and then in a sentence that I've never been able to forget, Tom said, uh, we have tried without success to find an appropriate distinguished visitor this year. <laughs> would, would you come instead? It's, it's been a joy, it really has. <laughs> um, I have enjoyed it very much. I want to point out uh, a couple of other honored guests here this evening. Um, one I have only known for a couple of days. Her name is Margaret Weisblut. Uh, we met in the faculty club and uh, Margaret is right over there and Margaret is soon to be, no, you're 101 and a few months, right? <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> Seated in the front row next to the best thing that ever happened to me <laughs> is um, the widow of my wife, Grace Ann's faculty advisor, and my faculty advisor, Nate Maccabee. And Professor Eleanor Maccabee is soon to be 101 years old. I, I draw attention to these, to these two distinguished ladies for only one reason. If they can stay awake, so can you. <laughs> Sorry, folks, but that's about as cute as it gets. Um, <laughs> freedom of the press in the United States is at a fragile stage, suffering ironically from an overdose of freedom and the exuberant high that often precedes an imminent crash. We have, as an industry, fallen victim to the opioid that is Donald Trump. I want to see if I can arrange this so that I don't have to keep playing with it. There we go. Donald Trump has been very good for the business of journalism and very dangerous for the profession, but he deserves neither all the credit nor even most of the blame. The circumstances that are undermining freedom of the press have evolved over a period of decades. They are the product of an 18th century process being overwhelmed by 20th and 21st century technology. It has been a gradual process, but has evolved to a point that it now enables the actual democratization of journalism. The means to communicate instantaneously with large numbers of people over vast distances are now essentially available to anyone with access to the internet. Simply because we can do something, however, does not mean that we should. What might the consequences be, for example, were we to apply the potential of the internet to the realization of a pure political democracy? 
It no longer takes a great deal of imagination to envision an internet app that would enable each and every legitimate voter to cast her ballot through a portable device employing a retinal scanner as a means of identification. We could vote multiple times a day on as many or as few issues and legislative proposals as we chose. One issue, one vote. It might be uninformed, it could be bought or traded, not too dissimilar, in other words, from the system now in place, but vastly more democratic. <laughs> Town and city councils, state legislatures, the House and Senate would become superfluous. In time, this new technology could totally eliminate the need for representational government. A truly horrific idea that one hopes would be rejected on even a moment's reflection. As flawed as our political process may be, it recognizes the value of elected representatives with time and staff to weigh and consider important issues and the understanding that they will periodically be held to account. There remains a modicum of discipline within the process. Pure democracy would border on chaos. And yet. We seem enchanted by the democratization of journalism. Let us recall the wisdom of Martin J. Dooley, a fictional Irish bartender created in the 1890s by the journalist Finlay Peter Dunn. Mr. Dooley's description of the newspaper as an agency that comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable is actually a squishy and truncated version of the significantly more caustic original. The newspaper, opined the sage Dooley, does everything for us. It runs the police force and the banks, commands the militia, controls the legislature, baptizes the young, marries the foolish, comforts the afflicted, afflicts the comfortable, buries the dead, and roasts them afterward. The newspaper was an agency of such unmatched power and influence that no equivalent or countervailing force existed. To be a Hearst or a Pulitzer at the dawn of the 20th century, in other words, was to wield almost limitless power. It was only as each technological advance displaced or diluted the influence of a previous power center that freedom of the press was bestowed on an ever-increasing body of practitioners. Over the course of the next hundred years, newspaper chains and national magazines had their moment in the sun to be superseded in short order by radio and then television, the body of news consumers doubling and redoubling. What all these media had in common, though, was that they operated in largely a unidirectional fashion. Each gathered and processed information in its own way, but all of them spoke to their consumers, making merely the shallowest pretense of listening to how their audiences might be reacting. The late Wilbur Schramm, who taught for a while here at Stanford, coined a term to describe the role played by media in filtering the flow of information. Gatekeepers, he called us. At the apogee of network television news' influence, CBS anchorman Walter Cronkite was the national personification of that breed, authoritative but avuncular. Known to tens of millions, widely trusted, Cronkite was the cohesive agent who gave Americans of disparate backgrounds a sense of common identity. His counterparts on NBC and ABC News played similar if somewhat less influential roles. Each brought a slightly different flavor to the role, but the function remained largely the same. Electronic pater familias, disseminators of essentially undisputed facts. The audiences for these broadcasts existed, for the most part, in isolation. Ratings services numbered them in their tens of millions, but they watched and listened 
in solitary or family units, only vaguely aware of one another's existence. The fact that the FCC's so-called fairness doctrine required licensed broadcasters to treat controversial issues in, and this is a quote, in an honest, equitable, and balanced fashion, added to an impression of national harmony. Insofar as media had any influence on Congress and the drafting of legislation, it encouraged moderation and compromise. It was a bland but relatively orderly process. The democratization of journalism had not yet begun. Then in 1987, something called the Fairness Doctrine was abolished. And by the following year, the unabashedly conservative viewpoints of Rush Limbaugh were broadcast on a nationally syndicated radio program. That is worthy of particular note. Limbaugh made no pretense of impartiality. His approach has been partisan, his style bombastic, and utterly lacking in humility. If network news anchors wrap themselves in an aura of rigid neutrality, Limbaugh mockingly insists that his is a talent on loan from God, <laughs> which he promptly put to use creating the Limbaugh Institute of Advanced Conservative Studies. During the almost 30 years that Limbaugh has served as a national radio host, his success has spawned a small army of mostly conservative imitators. Limbaugh alone claims a weekly audience of 20 million listeners. It may be 15 or 16 million, but huge. Indisputably, he has given his radio audience, the ditto heads as they call themselves, a striking sense of ideological identity. Even as Rush Limbaugh attained national prominence, the World Wide Web, making its initial appearance in 1991, provided public access to the internet. For the first time in recorded history, millions of people had direct access to a medium of mass communication. The notion of a web countless connective strands linking previously isolated audience into ever-expanding units of common interests, political inclinations, sympathies and prejudices, laid the foundation for a social revolution waiting to happen. Mass communication, which traditionally flowed in only one direction, now opened infinite lines of contact available to anyone with access to the internet. As readers and listeners and viewers grew accustomed to having voices of their own, and with the growing awareness that their voices had been granted access to audiences of their own, the democratization of journalism was truly underway. More or less simultaneous with the rise of the internet, cable and satellite television offered fresh alternatives to broadcast news. The presentation of news on CNN, for example, was a 24-hour operation. No longer did the news consumer have to wait until such time as the networks deigned to program an update. Ted Turner's contribution to the spiraling evolution of coverage was to promise news whenever it suited the viewer. If Turner and CNN promised greater convenience and accessibility, Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes, creators of Fox News, offered an alternative ideology. The existing outlets tended toward liberalism and the left. Fox skewed right. It may have been intended from the first to serve a largely political purpose, but it was also hugely successful commercially. Financially and ideologically, Fox duplicated on television what Rush Limbaugh had achieved on radio, and it was done according to a new set of rules. A modest amount of journalism was committed during the day, but in the evenings when advertising rates were highest, objectivity 
was largely discarded. Subjective opinions stroked and stoked controversy and built audience. Furthermore, bloviating is cheap. Panel discussions are cheap. The traditional building blocks of journalism, reporting, editorial supervision, fact-checking, were largely ignored. Whereas network radio and television had tra traditionally served a cohesive role, drawing audiences of disparate backgrounds together, the fragmentation of media along narrow ideological lines has led to the creation of opinion silos, offering radically different worldviews. The success of Fox News with its heavy reliance on loud, opinionated hosts touting the virtues of conservatism, encouraged the corporate owners of MSNBC to double down on the liberal or progressive side of the political agenda. An endless stream of panel discussions hosted by journalists unencumbered by any apparent commitment to objectivity flooded the highest rated and therefore the most profitable hours of Fox and MSNBC. CNN, struggling to retain at least a semblance of objectivity, nevertheless succumbed to the economic imperatives of garrulous, opinionated panels, dubious experts expressing themselves with largely unsubstantiated certainty on the hot button issues of the day. Whatever else we may think of them, let the record show that panels are easy and cheap, while the actual gathering of news is neither. The voices of the people reinforce the trend. Twitter, Facebook, social media in general, established the avenues by which audiences in real time and in vast numbers were able to communicate directly with the communicators. Their message was clear, more ideology, more controversy, more red meat. The implied authority that once gave broadcast network producers and anchors the latitude to determine what was important, what needed coverage, waned. Losing audience and therefore advertising revenue, the networks looked for cost-saving measures, the ranks of foreign correspondents, who once numbered in the dozens at each network, were sharply reduced, as was the coverage of foreign news. The notion expressed by the Federal Communications Commission that broadcasters have an obligation to, and again this is a quote, operate in the public interest, convenience, and necessity, that was gradually displaced by the imperative of the marketplace. If previously network newscasts gathered and disseminated information that its producers believed the public needed to know, the new profit-based dynamic placed a greater emphasis on providing the public with what it wanted to see. The preeminence of the evening news anchor as emblematic of the network's commitment to hard news was displaced by the rise of folksier hosts of the morning shows, where the emphasis on soft news and banal chatter generated literally hundreds of millions of dollars a year. The marketplace has dictated a diminished role for network news operations. It was not, however, until the 2016 presidential campaign, what must be called the beginning of the age of Trump that the news business and the business of news became indistinguishable from one another. Without providing hard evidence, the New York Times contended toward the end of that campaign, that television had provided Mr. Trump with $2 billion worth of free publicity. It would be churlish to quibble. Mr. Trump had merely to suggest a willingness to appear, then producers and anchors set aside all customary conditions. Previously, the Sunday morning talk shows had required that guests be in attendance on the set. Trump was permitted to appear by phone. There was a day when the occurrence of a major news event was a prerequisite to live coverage. The cable networks thought nothing 
of devoting live coverage to an empty tarmac awaiting the arrival of Mr. Trump's plane. What he might actually say on arrival seemed to be of little or no concern. Trump was a ratings magnet. Taken in isolation, these are relatively trivial developments. Collectively, they amount to a lowering of standards that cannot easily be recovered. Undeniably, the Trump presidency has also revitalized tough investigative journalism. The New York Times, the Washington Post have done some brilliant reporting. But it has been hard to escape the sense of a prosecutorial mission, a determination to bring Trump down. The blizzard of presidential tweets enabling Mr. Trump to communicate directly and immediately with tens of millions of mostly supporters has incessantly hammered home the theme of the lying media and fake news. It does not help that so many reporters incurring the president's wrath have become regular spear carriers on cable television. Legend has it that back in the 1980s, a reporter for the New York Times asked his then executive editor, Abe Rosenthal, for permission to appear as a guest on a television news program. It may even have been Nightline. Of course, <laughs> Rosenthal is reported to have said, only then don't come back to the New York Times. Abe was doing more than simply asserting his newspaper's claim to all of his reporters' time and energy. He was avoiding the perception that a reporter's objectivity could be undermined by expressing an opinion on nationwide television. These days, cable news programs could barely exist without the platoons of reporters from the New York Times and the Washington Post dropping the latest nuggets from their inquiries into President Trump's possible collusion with the Russians, his mental state, or his likely interference with Robert Mueller's investigation. Their reporting may be, indeed usually is, meticulous and beyond reproach. But their regular appearance on panels that all but salivated the prospect of bringing Trump down contribute to the perception that they subscribe to the same agenda. The democratization of media, the accessibility of the internet to so many who lack any journalistic training, any discipline whatsoever, suggests a loosening of standards that must inevitably infect journalism overall. To the contrary, it demands a greater discipline than ever before from the ranks of our professionals. Lyndon Johnson used to warn against the dangers of public, publicly engaging unscrupulous rivals. You get down in the mud and start wrestling with a hog, you're both going to get dirty, and the hog loves it. <laughs> it will certainly not be easy. Traditional news organizations are struggling in the face of mounting skepticism to maintain discipline and objectivity while an army of undisciplined and wholly subjective amateurs undermines the very notion of freedom of the press. In truth, there is no real equivalence between the failings of the establishment media and the stark propaganda of Breitbart News and its right-wing echo chambers, but we are sailing in uncharted waters. Donald Trump and the establishment media are locked in a toxic embrace that may ultimately serve neither. The president caters to the lowest common denominator among his supporters by vilifying the press as enemies of the people. Whether the Trump presidency survives or not, tens of millions of Americans have had their confidence in the concepts of objective reality, indisputable facts, and good journalism undermined, perhaps irretrievably. Freedom of the press was never intended to convey an absolute democratization of the process. Freedom, unrestrained by rules, boundaries, discipline, is merely anarchy. 
freedom of the press that lowers its standards on the one hand and abolishes them all together on the other, disparages the very term. The internet, originally designed to survive even nuclear war, has produced a democratization of journalism that can never be entirely reversed. We have been propelled into an era of fake news and alternative facts. While the media have surely changed over the past 50 years, however, the antidote to lies and propaganda has not. Facts. But even that is an oversimplification. We are becoming, have in large measure already become, highly selective in our approach to facts. We are predisposed to favor those facts that confirm our existing biases. While gradually, inexorably, we develop a resistance to those facts that challenge our prejudices. We are indignant at how casually the mainstream networks and newspapers and websites are tarred with the brush of fake news and lying media. And it is entirely appropriate that we recognize and label those efforts as corrosive to the very foundations of a vibrant democracy. But a word of caution. As quickly and easily as we identify the failings of news sources with which we disagree, we tend to be less scrupulous about what we find when we consume material within our own preferred echo chamber. There is no legitimate comparison between the failings of Breitbart and the New York Times, or Infowars and the Washington Post. But the distinctions between the most partisan hosts on Fox and their counterparts on MSNBC are less clear. There is barely even the pretense of objectivity on either cable network's most popular primetime programs. The passion which Fox brings to the agenda of a deep state conspiracy, linking the intelligence community, mainstream media, the FBI, and government holdovers from the Obama administration is frequently matched over at MSNBC by an obsessive focus on any new development, however trivial, in the Stormy Daniels saga. There is not a day, not a program on MSNBC, and truth be told, on CNN also, when anything hinting at the president's mental instability or evidence pointing to obstruction of justice or the growing list of current and former White House aides and Trump associates facing legal problems of their own does not constitute the principal program diet. And even then it should be noted there is a fine line between merely reporting these events and drawing such obvious satisfaction from them. Too many of our news organizations are readily identifiable as team players, invested either in the triumph or the downfall of Donald Trump. Let me be absolutely clear. What President Trump has done in denouncing his critics in the media as enemies of the people is shameful and dangerous to the degree that he is undermining confidence in the most fundamental American institutions, the press, the judiciary, the intelligence community, the Justice Department, any number of government agencies and federal employees, the president is wittingly or unwittingly colluding with this country's enemies. Those are also their goals. But my focus tonight is not on him. It's on us, my colleagues and me in the media. Our obsessive coverage of Donald Trump, be it from the vantage point of ally or adversary, is deeply rooted in business interests. He has been very, very good for the business of journalism. The New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, CNN, MSNBC have all seen their bottom lines improve in the age of Trump. 
it would seem that we relish loathing one another. Here's the danger. We have become a nation divided. And in nursing our passions for and against the president, we are stirring and magnifying our pre-existing differences. He has become the prism through which we identify and measure one another. In one of her costliest mistakes during the presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton said, and this is a quote, you could put half of Trump's supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables, right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. And unfortunately, there are people like that, and he has lifted them up. Wow. Wow. Almost 63 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. And Mrs. Clinton casually dumped more than 30 million of them, half of Trump's supporters, into what she called that basket of deplorables. Maybe it's time to cool passions down a little on both sides. For six of the past 12 weeks, I've been what is generously referred to as a distinguished visitor at the Haas Center. The center justifiably prides itself on encouraging an ethos of voluntarism, I love and admire the spirit that animates volunteers, but it's not enough. I believe that we need to reinstitute a policy of universal service among our 18-year-olds. I realize there is absolutely no chance that Congress will reinstitute a military draft. But a form of universal service that offers the military as an option while giving our young a wide range of humanitarian alternatives, ranging from VISTA to the Peace Corps? Why not? I cannot help but believe that if young people from all over the country served side by side for 18 months or two years, confronting common problems and serving the national welfare, that they would emerge from that experience less likely to regard one another as either deplorables or enemies of the people. The late Will Rogers liked to say, you know, we're all ignorant, just about different things. I could not, and I suspect that many of you could not, replace the roof on my home, or construct a usable piece of furniture or shoot, gut, and skin a deer, curing the meat to feed my family over a long winter. I am ignorant about so many things that millions of my fellow citizens excel in. A little more humility among those of us who've been educated at great universities like this one would go a long way toward cooling the resentments of those who learned their skills in less formal settings. Then perhaps, they might be more inclined to accept the assurances of people like me who've spent their entire lives in journalism that an informed electorate really does depend on professional reporters working with equally committed editors, producers, and fact checkers. Journalism has never been perfect. Never, never, never. Never has been, never will be. But as long as we can keep the ideology out of it, as long as the consumers can believe that we're doing the very best we can to keep them accurately informed of issues that are important to their lives, we may still find our way out of this mess. Remember Winston Churchill's assessment of us. The Americans, he said, always end up doing the right thing, but only after they've exhausted every other alternative. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We've, uh, 
we've got microphones here, and if my if my watch is correct, we've got uh, what do we got? We got about 20 minutes together. Uh, you can feel free to come up and ask a question, or even make a statement. But if you make it too long, I've had 6,000 programs worth of experience in cutting people short. <laughs> so, microphones in both aisles, go ahead, sir, you're up first. Yep. Okay. It's okay, uh, thank you, it's really an honor to hear, to, uh, hear about your uh, sharings. So my question is, um, you mentioned about freedom of speech, but uh, uh, also another important thing is the freedom of thinking which means people were able to critically think and judge things in a more uh, in a fair way. Uh, for instance, recently we've seen um, the, what's going on in Syria when the uh, US, uh, or at least from the government side, is criticizing on its uh, use of chemical weapons. But if we think back uh, in the times of Iraq, the uh, US is also criticizing its weapon of mass destruction when actually there's none, mm -hmm. there's none found. So uh, uh, the role of media here, although we, we know that the U.S. value their human rights and their, um, the democracy progress, but would they also or sometimes uh, look at things from another side, uh, which is uh, um, the fact-based? For example, I'm sorry, there, what, what was the last thing you said? Fact-based. Fact-based, so, yes. Um, if there has been a really convincing, um, uh, let's say, um, inspections and uh, um, if there's really a chemical weapon used or by which side before they make the uh, decision to wage this kind of thing. And um, the media may play an important role here to uh, give people the thoughts from both sides rather than only a one-sided um, Look, I, I think I get the idea, but the, uh, I, I don't take issue with anything you have said. And remember, I did say that the the media in this country, the press in this country, has never, never, never been perfect. We make terrible mistakes. The run-up to the war in Iraq in 2003, as you correctly point out, there was a lot of reporting that was done before we had a chance to really know what the facts were. Much of the, of the reporting that has been done, and one of the things that troubles me about these days even more than what happened back in 2003, is that a lot of the coverage, for example, of the, the uh, missile strikes in Syria just a few days ago, depend or seem to depend much more on whether we belong to one opinion group or the other opinion group. If you're for Trump, you are wildly in favor of these strikes and insist that they are superb and they've done whatever they were supposed to do and as the president tweeted, mission accomplished. If you are opposed to Trump, you point out that basically it doesn't seem to have had much of an impact on the, on the overall Syrian situation, not to mention the fact that things like chlorine gas and sarin gas, chlorine gas is widely available they don't, they don't need to manufacture it especially, and much of the damage that they have done in Syria has been dropping bombs with chlorine gas in them. If I, if I haven't conveyed to you this evening that I am deeply committed to finding facts, to the honest, accurate, and objective dissemination of facts, then I'll have to go back and write an addendum to the speech because that's, that's really what I was trying to say here this evening. If we allow ourselves to be guided by the inflamed political opinions of people either on the left or on the right, we're doomed. A democracy demands good journalism. The free expression of good, fact-gathered, and based journalism. That's all I can say. Yes, sir. I'd be curious if you could comment on the tenor of the commentary in the pre-election uh, discussion of Hillary Clinton and the focus on the emails, both at 
the New York Times and other mainstream media, I certainly had the impression that it was exaggerated in the grand scheme of the uh, you know, negative qualities of the candidate. And even your reference to her obviously mistaken uh, uh, remark, uh, how, how off do you think she was in saying maybe 10% of Americans do harbor uh, you know, very biased uh, uh, homophobic and, and other positions? So I'm, I'm, uh, I just like your comments on that. I, I sure. also, uh, as you remember, Lindsey Graham before the election called Hillary Clinton the most dishonest person in the world who's about to be elected president. Mm -hmm. So it does seem like um, Hillary also might deserve a break in terms of the excessive attacks on her versus hers against some others. No, look, I think it's a, I think it's a perfectly fair question. And, and the, I think the most honest answer I can give you is that by the time we got to the point in which there was really intense, and you might argue excessive coverage of the question of Hillary and her emails, I think A, pretty much all political experts in this country and most of the press corps firmly believed that Hillary Clinton was gonna win that election, right? Having said that, I think they were starting to look at their coverage of Donald Trump over the previous six months and saying, I mean, we've really done a tap dance on his head. Maybe we need to be a little more concerned uh, you know, whether after the election we aren't, we aren't believed to have been totally culpable in killing the, the Trump presidency and lifting Hillary up. In other words, I agree with your perception that we, as, as a group, overdid the, the email issue. Um, having said that, you're always going to find these vile exchanges in our political process. That goes back 200 years, right, and more. Um, what I'm more concerned about is whether we are capable of maintaining some kind of balance over the long haul. And this notion that the, that the establishment press is really invested in bringing Trump down. It's not an issue, I mean, I must tell you, it's not an issue of what I believe ought to happen. It's an issue of what I believe the press is responsible for doing. And our responsibility, the New York Times has its op-ed op page, so does the Washington Post. I've got no problem with them saying whatever the hell they want to say on the op-ed pages. I do object to seeing that sort of subjective coverage on the front page. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Just pull it down. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Um, the late First Lady Barbara Bush uh, <coughs> championed literacy. And one of the things she mentioned was that it uh, can change America. Um, if we had more literacy, I'm paraphrasing. Um, would you say that in a democracy, um, a country like ours, we should champion literacy so that people can use their own knowledge to decipher what is right, what is wrong, to make that kind of, um, those kind of decisions? And we know that literacy is also a human right. Um, what, how do you, as a journalist, have seen this play out in terms of your experience and your trajectory? As let, me, a, let, me, let me see if, if I have understood the thrust of your question correctly. Mm -hmm. Do you seriously think for a moment that I'm going to let the Headline in the Stanford Daily tomorrow be, <laughs> Koppel opposes literacy. I would hope not. 
<laughs> Not a chance. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm, a great, I'm a great fan of literacy. I, <laughs> I have been known to read entire books. <laughs> Well, that's better uh, I, than me, then. <laughs> yeah. uh, look, I'm, I'm teasing you, obviously, but um, I cannot imagine a thriving, vibrant democracy surviving in the absence of a literate population. Mm -hmm. And I must tell you, I worry a little bit about the, the ubiquitous nature of these mm -hmm. things, right? Uh, I, I did a piece just a few weeks back on the CBS Sunday Morning Show in which uh, I interviewed uh, a, uh, a Stanford professor on the subject of diminishing attention span. Mm -hmm. The fact that, uh, you know, the fact that our younger people today are, are turning these things on and off, switching screens, an average of 400 times a day. Many of them doing it six, seven, 800 times a day. The average length of time that people are spending on a given screen before they switch off to some other item between five and 10 seconds. That, you know, I mean, obviously, you got the smartest people in the country going to Stanford. And, and they're gonna make it through and they clearly are reading what they need to read. But that, that diminishing attention span, that sort of hummingbird quality of flitting from item to item to item to item of never being able to stay on one issue, concentrate on one issue, I, I, I'm sorry, I, it's gotta be damaging and, and I'm terribly worried about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, you talked about how good the age of Trump has been for the business of journalism. Yeah. And I know as a consumer of news, I can't remember spending so much time consuming news either as in the last few years. Um, what do you see as the best path back to health after the age of Trump for uh, freedom of the press? Well, I, I mean, can you imagine Let's just say for the sake of argument that for one reason or another, Mr. Trump is replaced by Mike Pence. What do you think is gonna to happen to the bottom line of CNN and MSNBC and, you know, Pence, who cares, right? Um, look, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna make it out of this. You know, there, there will be an age after the age of Trump. But I'm much more concerned about how our view of one another, how ingrained that is becoming. And to the degree that we, that we quite literally are moving into our different tribal camps and perceiving people with opinions other than our own as being adversaries, if not enemies, that's unhealthy. It really is. We, we can't survive that. And if that is still the case five years from now, 10 years from now, this country has seen its best days come and go. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. I am still a fan of the old school, you know, news broadcasts on the network. So I was wondering, in your opinion, between ABC, CBS, um, NBC, which network gives us more hard news, more <laughs> old school news? <laughs> I, for one, see on your old employer, ABC, that it seems like it's all an entertainment show what their newscasts are. Yeah, you know, look, so. I... <laughs> <laughs> I read the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. My wife and I will skim through the evening news broadcasts, and we actually spend more time watching the BBC. Uh, I listen to NPR in the morning. Uh, the fact of the matter is that for business reasons, the three major commercial networks have opted not to get out of the business of hard news. They're still in the business of hard news, but they're not nearly as committed to it as they were 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, and they, uh, look, when I say 
They're putting more money into Good Morning America, the Today Show, the CBS Morning Show. That's because that's where, you know, it's the, you're, you're too young to remember the name Willie Sutton, but he was a famous bank robber. And a reporter once ran up to Sutton as he was being escorted out by the FBI and said, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> right? That's where the money is. People, you know, there's much more money to be made in entertainment news these days than in the kind of news that, that I, maybe my memory is hazy and maybe I'm making too much of the good old days, but when I was a young foreign correspondent, I was one of about 35 foreign correspondents at ABC. CBS may have had about 40. NBC probably had close to 50. We were all over the world and we stayed there, we lived there. Some of us spoke the languages, right? You know how many foreign correspondents ABC has today? Five, right? You can't expect the same kind of coverage of world affairs that way. All right, we're down to our last two or three questions, depending on how long your questions are and how windy my answers are. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I share your concern about the uh, political polarization of the populace, the distrust we have among one another and across the political divide. And I'm asking for advice to, I'm a print journalist, and what advice do you have for us about what kinds of stories we can be looking for, how we can be telling them, um, and then maybe even any examples of things that you've seen done recently. You know, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm um, duck that question and let me tell you why. Because you know the answer. <laughs> what do people need to know? I mean, quite literally, I remember 45 years ago, working for an executive producer at ABC News, who used to say every day, it's very simple, here's how we put our broadcast together. Is my home safe? Is my country safe? Is the world safe? To the degree that we can answer those questions, and you can, you can bring, I mean, look, there are thousands of issues, local issues, Palo Alto issues, Los Altos Hills issues, Redwood City issues, San Francisco issues, Oakland issues, whether it's homelessness, whether it's the high cost of, the high cost of housing, whatever it is, issues that are important to the community that either reads your paper or listens to your podcast or whatever it is you do. That hasn't changed. That's what journalism needs to be. Instead of something about, you know, the latest diatribe that one politician has leveled against another. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to ask about how we're going to get back to, to re-professionalize journalism. I was a journalist in the 80s and 90s, and as far as I can tell, journalism hasn't really been considered a profession for very long. It was sort of post-Watergate, and, and it lasted until uh, the changes that you've told us about have been happening over the last couple of decades. So what's going to happen, given that it's a private enterprise and the society that we're in? How are we going to move this back in a more... Well, I think it's, I think it's only the... And, and I'm sorry I take issue with you. I think there is still a lot of professional journalists oh, out I there do too. doing a but. brilliant job. And, and if I criticize my colleagues from the Times and the Post for appearing on all those MSNBC and CNN programs, it's because I respect them as great journalists. And I don't want that to get muddied by the perception that they are on a program, the clear intent of which is to diminish everyone's esteem if it's still possible among certain, <laughs> you know, for the, for the president. Um, I'm much more worried about the, about the technological threat of this democratization of journalism uh, because there are so many people out there now who can, even though they don't have any training in the, in the profession, even though they're not working 
you know, in teams with other people who can keep them from making terrible mistakes. We're down to our last question. Make it really brilliant. <laughs> I'll try my best. Uh, first of all, I wish you best luck on the universal service. I think this is the only country that people actually don't all help out. It doesn't have to be military, just whatever. But the question I have is, what is your opinion or reasoning, explanation, anything, on the systematic censorship that is going on? Any channel, I mean, at home we're okay, as long as we think about uh, deplorable or not, we're busy, but there's a lot, you've been there, there's a lot going on all over the world, but we're cutting one channel after another, even on a web or um, satellite, whatever, in the name of their propaganda, because we disagree with them, because this, because of that. And there's so many of them lately. What do you think? I, I honestly didn't really understand the question that I'm being Why asked. Why are we discontinuing different channels one after another, and nobody sees them anymore in this country? Yeah, but it, honestly, we're not. We're, we're creating more and more outlets all the time. Not international, you are... You're safe. talking internationally? Correct. Ah. I can name five right now. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I... Uh, look, that's Just the because we disagree or call them propaganda it still does not take yes. my right to learn about them. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's, it's... We have to be an example to the rest of the world. To the degree that we are undermining the respect of other people for the way we do our business for the way we communicate with one another, for the way we treat each other in our, political, in our political environment. We make it easier for the genuine dictators overseas to cut back on communication. You're looking at me as though I'm totally missing the point of your question. I believe there's a lot of channels that they're not run by dictators nor by any state government. The easiest one is your news. Is this continued three, four days at a time whenever something comes up? Press TV, RTV. I mean, we have a name and reason for each one of them why they're not there anymore. Even our Christian channels here, or let's say uh, Alex Jones, whatever. I mean, if Rush Limbo can say whatever he wants, why can't others say and let me decide what is propaganda, what is not, what is fact? I don't well, want you're, to just you're talking about something like over. Russian television being broadcast in this country. That was one of them, yes. And, and you're, you're objecting to the fact? I, I, I'm unaware of the fact. Has it been eliminated? Can you no longer get it on the air? You cannot get it anywhere. And that was, all this started, I mean, it's been going on for last 10, 15 years. But since Trump came, uh, which I vo voted for, by the way, it, it, has gone a lot worse. I mean, okay. you do not, you cannot even search them on I, look, Google. Look, I, I hate to end on an area in which I'm, I'm really not knowledgeable. I can't, I can't answer you accurately. I will do something else, okay? I'm gonna leave you with something totally unexpected. You don't have to stand there for it. <laughs> Forgive me, I, I um, I've, I've, one of the books that I have read recently is a book about Ulysses S. Grant. And following his presidency, he went on a world tour. And among other places, he visited China, where he was enthusiastically received. And I'm afraid we're not gonna have time for any more questions. This is all you get. <laughs> and he was taken to the Great Wall, and he commented on the uselessness, now what would this have been, about 1885, on the uselessness of a wall in keeping out your enemies. So we're, you know, we're talking about some time ago. That, you know, hold on, you don't know where I'm going. That, that has a certain relevance because in 1972, I was in China with Richard Nixon. And President Nixon was taken to the Great Wall and uh, one of my ABC colleagues walked up to him with a microphone and said, Mr. President, what do you think of the wall? And Nixon said, one can only say 
And for those of you too young to remember, this is actually a pretty damn good Nixon. Um, one can only say, upon looking at this wall, that this is truly a great wall. So on the, on the flight from Beijing to Shanghai, I was thinking about, you know, he had a lot of smart people around him. I was thinking somebody could have come up with something better. <laughs> so I wrote a song, which in my fevered imagination, I had Richard Nixon singing on the Great Wall in response to that question. And if you promise to sit down, I will sing it for you now. <laughs> It, it goes something like this. In fact, it goes exactly like this. <laughs> it's a grand old wall. It's a long-standing wall. Wins the prize for its size and its age. It gave just rewards to the Mongol hordes. Drove the kulaks away in a rage. From Beijing to the seas, it has saved the Chinese till the days of the Guomindang, from Ming to Han, and on, and on, where the Great Wall, you can't go wrong. 